Hello everyone today and welcome to the role of data storage in accelerating time to insights. Today's webinar is sponsored by Pure Storage and produced by Actual Tech Media. I'm Keith Ward with Actual Tech Media, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for this especially timely presentation. But before we get to today's content, I do need to cover some housekeeping items. First of all, we want this to be an informative event for you. So we encourage any questions in the questions box in your webinar control panel, which you can see there uh, up at the top toward the right, hopefully. That's also the place to let us know where you're logging in from today. And a bunch of you have already. And it's great to see Brandon and Brian and Richard and Ben and Jorge and Gilbert and Jim and Edgar and Douglas and the whole lot of you. Great to see everyone. Uh, keep letting us know where you're logging in from and how your day is going. Now, that uh, questions box is also the place to let us know about any technical issues. If you can't hear something, can't see something, what you want to do first is a browser refresh because that'll fix most of the problems that you've got. If that doesn't work, though, let us know in the Q&A and we'll provide further technical assistance. Under Okay, next is we've got the handouts there that you can see. That handout section is right next to your questions tab in the uh, control box there. Uh, and there you will find a link to, to uh, see more about pure storage solutions. You'll also find great links to the Gorilla Guide Book Club, which uh, gives you access to our uh, books on technology topics. And there's also a link to the ATM Event Center, which has our calendar of upcoming events. We've got some really juicy ones that are coming up uh, next week. So check them out and sign up today if you see something you like. All right, third, at the end of this uh, webinar today, we'll be awarding a $250 Amazon gift card to one lucky registrant. Of course, you do have to be in attendance during the live event to qualify for the prize. The official terms and conditions of today's prize drawing can be found in the handout section. And with that, folks, why don't we move on and get started with the uh, main content here. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our presenters today. They are Bernard Marr, who has the almost intimidating title of internationally best-selling business author and world-renowned futurist. And Sean Rosemarin, the Vice President of R&D for Pure Storage. They are ready to go. So uh, Bernard, I am gonna hand off the mic to you. You now have the floor. Okay, hi and welcome. Today's topic surrounds AI and modern analytics, and more specifically, the role that data storage plays in accelerating time to insight. And I'm joined today by Sean Rosemarin, who is the VP R&D Customer Engineering at Pure Storage. Welcome, Sean. Yeah, thank you, Bernard, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here today. Where are you joining us from today? Well, I'm from our brand new offices here in uh, Santa Clara, California, where the sun is shining. Uh, and uh, it's another beautiful day in California. What can I tell you? <laughs> beautiful. Um, maybe you can explain a bit more about what Pure Storage does at, at a high level. Yeah, sure. So, you know, Pure Storage has been around, uh, well, well, more than a decade. Uh, and uh, essentially, you know, our purpose is to uncomplicate data storage. Uh, we've built our company really around the mandate that, you know, storage, data storage is critically important. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about why that is today, uh, becoming more and more important. Uh, but frankly, it's uh, just been too complex to operate, uh, too power hungry, uh, you know, too difficult to scale, hmm. uh, requiring too much human capital. And so, you know, Pure really set down the path of leveraging Flash, uh, specifically Flash storage. Uh, to solve a lot of the problems uh, that we believe were plaguing the industry. And, uh, you know, frankly, our growth and our success uh, now, you know, reaching uh, in excess of $3 billion uh, a year in sales. Um, our message seems to be resonating pretty well. And uh, we're looking forward to the growth that will come with analytics and AI and uh, the increasing importance of data storage. Great. So, yeah, with all the 
enthusiasm we're seeing and the hype and even controversy about AI today, there's, I guess, one thing that isn't up for debate, and that's the importance and the value of data. Um, recently, IDC did some research and they found that 75% of decision makers say that data can lose value in, in, in days. And at the same time, 70% of, of people say that um, data is being underutilized. So this, this whole proliferation of data, which is pretty much an all-time high at the moment, it seems a non-brainer to run analytics on your data and to ensure you have great data practices when you, especially when you try to use AI. So can you talk more about the importance of data analytics in today's modern enterprise as you see it every day? Yeah, sure. So like, let's just take one step back and just talk about, you know, where we are in the stream of history here. So if we talk of, if we kind of contrast intelligence with ignorance, the difference between those two terms really is that intelligence says I know a lot about something and ignorance says I don't know a whole lot about something. And if we kind of go back in time to how original records were kept, we actually look at the origin of the word file, for instance, it was an individual basket that was kept by a group and it was your basket, your file, F-Y-L-E at the time. And that's what you stored all of your documents and all of your records in. You can imagine back in those times, it was a little bit difficult to go into your file per se and try to interpret what had happened, keep your records up to date. Well, the good news is through many, many hundreds of years, we moved from you know stone tablets and parchment to digital. And we're able to now record more than ever. The difference though is decades ago, we recorded things so that if we ever, if there was ever a doubt, if there was something to do with compliance or governance, we could go back and look at those records and we could actually look at what was recorded, what actually happened. It's only in the last couple of decades that we started to say, you know, what if we looked beyond governance and compliance? What if we looked beyond sort of, you know, legal discovery? And we started to say, what could we glean from our historical data? What could we glean from what happened in the past to actually help us try to predict what might happen in the future? And what we've seen is this increasing uh, ability for us to leverage data more and more effectively to get to a model or inference that would actually allow us to say, if we did this, we'll get that. And if we do this, then we'll get that. And so the reality is we are now at this point, given advances in technology, uh, both hardware and software platforms, um, that because everything's being recorded digitally, companies that can actually seize this opportunity to glean the value from their data are going to be those that have a significant advantage over those that do not. Very good. So I, I agree. And what role do you see analytics playing in especially laying the foundation to take advantage of more advanced technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning. Absolutely. So we're going to get into this in quite some detail um, in today's session. But once again, if we just think about, I really like to look at these evolutions because I think it helps the everybody really just get comfortable with the fact that this isn't just something that came out of, you know, uh, thin air and just arrived, and we should all be incredibly skeptical because it's so new and we're not sure how it's going to evolve. We're actually in the late stages of this evolution. If we think about, you know, legacy platforms for business intelligence, when we were building data cubes, uh, that's where I started my career. Apologies if that ages, ages me to your audience. Um, and we thought about then really how could we look at what happened in the past in the most effective way? And then we got to this concept of revenue operations that said, how can we really automate the way in which we report what's happening right now? And now we're in this evolution with modern analytics that says, really, how do we predict what's going to happen tomorrow? And when we think about that, analytics really becomes the foundation on which we look to AI. Because ultimately, if we can find a way to effectively organize and interpret and visualize our data, then we now have a blueprint for organizing and structuring that data on which we can build AI to go and drive the insights, right? The inference models that I suggest. Um, you know, you look at something like ChatGPT, I have to organize the data. I have to learn the data. I have to trust that the data itself 
is in good order. And then I can build an inference model. I can build a generative pre-trained model that says, now go use that to tell me what the answer to this question should be. And so, you know, using another analogy, if you think of your data like books in a library, um, a physical library, and you think of AI ML as the student of the library, in a curated library, a student or professor can rest assured knowing that the research and consolidation that they do will result in a high quality paper. Conversely, if you were to let a great student loose in a library of non-curated material, mileage will vary. The quality of the paper, the truthfulness of the paper, the relevance of the paper. And so really think of analytics as really getting your data in order, understanding that what you are now going to build the foundation of your models on is not just true and factual, but useful in terms of what it is that you want to glean out. Okay, and how does this ultimately impact the enterprise's ability to accelerate insights and, and drive data-driven business decisions? Well, let's contrast the old with the new. So in the world prior to analytics, we would bring the smartest people from our business together into a room. We would give them a bunch of questions, and they would go think about the answers. And those answers could take hours, could take days, could take weeks. And so by digitizing this and building a data pipeline to organize and structure the data and then be able to build a model on which we can ask these questions, uh, we ultimately speed up decision making. And speeding up decision making speeds up competitiveness. Uh, you know, and ultimately what this means is I can serve my customers better. I can improve the personalization in which I interact with them. I can bring products to market faster. I can look for cost savings and optimizations faster. I can lower risks through things like digital twins that allow me to look at when something's going to fail or what parts may end up having to be proactively recalled. Um, but think of it really as we augment and accelerate human capability. So we're getting the most out of the human capital in the organization. Kind of like putting a digital co-pilot into every function in our organization, allowing those humans to do their best work in the most efficient way possible. Very good. You, you speak to customers every day, um, customers who are trying to do all the things we've just talked about. What are some of the biggest challenges organizations are facing in their modern analytics and AI journeys? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. You know, if my enthusiasm alone could bring all of this to life, what a wonderful world we would live in. Um, there are a significant number of challenges. And for that reason, Bernard, I would say we're going to spend the next decade, maybe two, continuing to solve and refine how to get this, uh, this, this vision, how to bring this vision to life. So let's talk about what some of those challenges are. First of all, this probably won't surprise you. We've talked about garbage in, garbage out for decades. Uh, data quality is still the biggest issue. And if there's one thing I'd really want to share with your audience It's that, you know, if we remember the first time we took a run at modern analytics, we looked at something called data lakes or lake houses or whatever they happened to be. And we dumped all our data into this big repository, one of which had a big yellow elephant, uh, you know, tied to it in terms of what the model was going to be. But the fact is, many of those data lakes were actually data swamps. We put garbage in. And so when we put our trawlers and our fishing rods in the water to go try to glean some insights, we ended up catching the same garbage we put in. And so data quality is still one of the largest obstacles. Organizations have not effectively found a way to not just validate, is that a date? Is that a time? Is that an English word? We've got past that. But is that actually what happened? I'm just going to give you an example. If a doctor is transcribing records with a patient, the doctor is very focused on the patient, They're very focused on delivering health care. And so the quality of the notes may not be exactly what happened. But even worse, the patient may not actually be telling the doctor exactly what happened, right? How many drinks did you have this week? How many times did you go to the gym? How well have you been eating? And so the quality of that data, when we start to think about the fact that we're building models, whether I look at CRM for what happened in a particular sales pursuit, whether I look at health records, um, anything that is really intercepted, interpreted, and recorded by a human may not be an exact replication of the truth and therefore may affect the accuracy of the model. 
Machine driven data is a little bit different, right? If we're tracking altitude, we're tracking velocity, we're tracking wind speed. These are typically done by sensors. That's very different. But really data quality is one of those biggest issues. How are we going to clean and integrate our data? How are we going to ensure the different systems that are collecting the same data can interoperate so that this field of date in European format and this field of date in American format uh, or this particular measurement across metric and imperial uh, or these different systems on different sides of the world, how do we integrate those? We've solved some of that with ETL, extract, transform, load. Um, how are we going to bring unstructured data? into the mix? How are we going to start to unpack videos and unpack audio calls and unpack what's happening on a streaming basis? Um, how are we going to scale all of this data? How are we going to secure it to ensure that when we're looking at data sets and training them that we're not, you know, stepping on top of PII limitations or HIPAA limitations or GDPR limitations? Um, you know, so, so those are just some of what we have seen. And now as we enter this iteration of AI, we're starting to see a new, a couple of new challenges come to bear. The first one I would touch on is platform and platform integration. Uh, you know, we love to look at these charts of who plays in every element of the stack. And if you were to put that on your screen right now for the audience in AI, there are roughly a thousand players in the AI stack today. A thousand players from hundreds of vendors. And many of those have incredibly innovative, uh, you know, forward thinking technologies. Mm -hmm. But you can think as a enterprise, the uh, task of integrating and supporting that complexity is enormous. On top of that, you've got this new wonderful technology of GPUs, GPUs that can crunch data many times faster than CPUs. But they are also exponentially more expensive and they are also exponentially more power hungry. They're actually more power efficient, but they're more power hungry. And so you got to think about whether or not your current data center and the density on which the, the data center was built can handle that. And so that takes us to environmentals, concept of folks running out of power for the first time in our history. I think we're actually going to have a situation where we will physically not have enough electricity. Uh, and then to top it all off, Bernard, we've got legal asking us whether all this content that we're creating is actually ours and do we have a legal right to it? And is someone going to come down the path in a couple of years and say that code snippet, that piece of, uh, you know, audio, video, et cetera, is actually the property of someone else because it was learned based on content that was not openly accessible. So there's a lot going on here. And, uh, you know, I think that, like I said, we're in the early innings of this. The benefits are exciting, but there are definitely some challenges to get through. Very good. Yeah, you really articulated so many major challenges, challenges that I, that I see every day really well. And I'm always interested in seeing best practice examples. So are there any companies you are working with that, with, that are addressing these challenges really well and that might be using pure storage to do this? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I would showcase a couple of different. Let me start first with some of the incubators, right? So just like we saw incubators back in the, I'll say the dot-com uh, era, uh, we're now seeing a lot of incubators in AI, companies who are specializing in working with other companies to help them take their concepts and actually bring them to life. Uh, so there's actually one uh, out in South Korea, uh, Chungbuk Techno Park. Uh, they've become quite a you know, thriving development environment for deep learning and machine learning, uh, helping local South Korean companies uh, to bring their AI products to life. And frankly, their challenges were their existing storage infrastructure, their existing uh, compute network infrastructure could not deliver results fast enough. What they also found, though, was that they could not feed data to the GPUs fast enough. And let me just jump out for a moment and just really kind of help you understand that challenge. So if you think of a GPU as a PhD student that has incredible intelligence and ability to, to, to absorb information, but they need to be fed information on an ongoing basis. And so the GPUs are essentially checking books out of this library, reading them and then putting them back. But if you can't get them the next book fast enough, they don't do anything. They sit idle. And if you think of the energy and the cost that you've put into these GPUs, if you don't fully consume them, 
then you're not getting your return and you're actually wasting the money that you invested. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to look at a balanced environment that says, how fast can I get a data set to a GPU? And then how fast can I take the output of what it's uh, done with that information and then get it the next data set? And last but not least, how do I do this in a way that minimizes power consumption? And this is really where we talk to the benefit of where Pure comes in. When we look at an all flash data center and we look at the benefits of flash versus disk and we look at the current environment we're in, the more that I can free up energy, the more that I can free up electricity consumption, the more that I can free up human overhead and management, the more I can focus that energy savings, that efficiency, and those humans on what I'm actually trying to do, hmm. which is to solve uh, AI and analytics challenges. So when we look at Chungbuk uh, Techno Park, we also look at Crater Labs, another incubator out of Canada, similar problems. How do we speed up getting data to the GPUs? And how do we reduce power consumption and minimize resources tied to storage? Because the data sets are immense. The scale is large. But we can't look at the traditional ratios of storage admin to libraries or all these companies would frankly say there's no way we could support you. And so we've really seen at the front end of this, these incubators really looking to pure uh, both FlashBlade and Flash Array uh, to really help them drive that efficiency with Flash, help them feed the GPUs and in tandem, help them get off, you know, energy heavy disk and really moving to uh, energy efficient flash. Yeah, and both of your case studies illustrate that infrastructure can hinder the efficient utilization of data. So what ste steps can organizations take to ensure that their digital infrastructure doesn't obstruct the seamless flow of data and analytics? Um, how, how, what do they need to do in practice? Well, so I want to touch on one thing you said there, which is that infrastructure can really hinder progress. If you look at one of the largest AI projects in the world, uh, it's with Meta. It's their research super cluster. And, you know, publicly, we've been very clear that we are a key infrastructure partner to Meta. But I want to use them as an example because Meta really could go out and build whatever they wanted. They could go engineer whatever they wanted. They've got thousands of engineers. But the reality is when we looked and they looked at what they were doing in relation to AI, in relation to the next generation of business for Meta, um, they look to Pure, they look to our storage model, they look to our infrastructure and our flash in order to build their first of its kind AI research cluster and still one of the largest in the world. Um, and so, you know, ultimately, when we think about, you know, what and where these organizations are, um, you know, Pure is talking to the largest banks, the largest healthcare organizations looking to find uh, the next cure for diseases, MacArthur Labs being a prime example during COVID and beyond, uh, you know, what sort of RNA treatment can go there. But infrastructure can hinder. Um, so I think you asked what steps can organizations take? And that's where you want to go next. Do I, yeah. am I catching that? Mm -hmm. So here's my suggestion. I'm going to give you a couple questions for your audience to contemplate. First of all, I would ask your audience to take a look at their data state. Yep, I'm talking about storage, right? And storage is this thing that you take for granted. It sits in the back, you know, you know, a lot of business decision makers don't think about it. I have a storage team. But I will tell you, in our experience, when you think about a balanced model for AI and ML, your storage foundation will be crucial to your success. You'll spend most of your time thinking about the platform. You'll spend most of your time thinking about the interface. But if you haven't solved for storage, it will stop you dead in your tracks. So think about, first of all, how you'll handle the scale of data growth, specifically, and I'm talking about, you know, logarithmic growth that AI and ML will bring as new content is created. We're pretty good as humans at creating content. Just wait till all of these co-pilots get started creating content that you as an enterprise are going to have to store and going to have to catalog and have to figure out how to manage. But also think about how you're going to manage the growth from traditional systems of record, the SAPs and the oracles of the world, to systems of innovation that are now generating way more data. Mm -hmm. 
your video systems, your audio systems, your logging systems, your security systems. And then think about how you're going to light up and integrate all of your analytics models. So this is the one that's really interesting. A lot of the most valuable data is actually sitting on disk, powered down, or on tape, up in a pallet somewhere in a dark warehouse. There's very little opportunity for you to glean anything from that data if you can't access it. And if accessing it means consuming power, that's a non-starter. So how do you look at what's on tape and what's on disk? And how do we look at, you know, how do we enable energy efficient flash to allow you to bring more online and be able to bring that data set into its element, um, which really gets us into space, power, and electricity. I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. This planet will run out of power on the trajectory we're on. And nuclear fission might help us if we get there. We're talking about nuclear fission for quite a while. Um, but on its current trajectory, we've already seen countries tell public cloud players they can't enter. There is just no available power for them to build a data center. Parts of London, Ireland, uh, even parts of the US and Virginia have actually said no more data centers can be built. So we're going to have to really tackle and organizations are going to have to think about what sort of electricity footprint are they going to require to deliver against these initiatives. And then I would really kind of start to think about how do you make sure that that data pipeline, once it's now a pivotal part of your business and a pivotal part of your decision making, how do you make sure it's available, resilient to, to failures, but also resilient to external attacks, right? How are you going to ensure that the data that now is driving your business doesn't get into the wrong hands. Plenty of challenges there. And I, I completely agree. I, I think at the moment, lots of organizations are trying to optimize their storage. Some of this is on tape for cost reasons, energy reasons, but if it's, it also means it's not accessible. So how, how do you see enterprise storage systems evolving to meet new demands for emerging and advanced technologies and particularly those that feed off all of this enterprise data that we we have available today and the even more data we'll have available tomorrow yeah i mean it's a great question look the good news is that pure is unilaterally focused on this particular area we are maniacal about driving innovation for storage We treat storage as high technology. We spend a higher percentage of R&D versus revenue than any of our competitors looking for how to solve this problem. And the good news is we already have a roadmap that we've publicly uh, declared that shows den density, performance, and energy efficiency way beyond anything that's available in the market. We see a lot of comparisons of hard drives to SSDs, but folks tend to forget that We don't actually leverage SSD solid state drives. We leverage our own technology, direct flash modules or DFMs, because it allows us to bring density of you know, 300 terabytes on a single DFM uh, by the end of 2026, right? Uh, we're talking about 75 terabyte, 150 terabyte, 300 terabyte drives. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because what it does is it frees up energy and it frees up human capital for you to go build against your AI and analytics initiatives. But it also provides the performance for you to feed these hungry GPUs with denser, more scalable, and more power efficient flash storage. Um, obviously we're biased, we're a flash storage company, but I can tell you having spent 25 years in the industry, flash is the enabler here. And if you're not sure, and you want to kind of play devil's advocate, tell me somewhere else in the world where we don't use flash storage to power our devices, other than the data center. Hmm. Our phones have all moved to flash. Our cars have all moved to flash. Our appliances have all moved to flash. Our consumer electronics have all moved to flash. The only place where spinning disks still exists is a data center because of the amount of work and effort it is to move those to flash. So, you know, when we look at the power of Flash as it relates to block, file, object, as it relates to powering up these archives, powering up these repositories, powering up these libraries that then become the basis for training and inference, we think there's huge opportunity. Um, but the last point I'll make is 
We also are a strong advocate that whatever storage platform is built needs to seamlessly link to the cloud. And so when we look at the big cloud players and we look at their ability to offer you know, native storage solutions, and I want to be clear, I'm talking about their native storage, not a vendor storage that sits on their floor, but their actual native infrastructure. The platform that Pure is building extends seamlessly to those clouds, allowing the underlying infrastructure to change, but the platform and the control plane to remain the same. So I'm really interested in this whole concept of using organizational data to enhance business outcomes. How do businesses do this and how does it go beyond just implementing AI? Oh, if it were only that easy. You know, I'm going to use an analogy here again, because I do believe if we look at history, uh, we can get a better vision towards the future. Let's think about e-commerce when it first came out. Once again, I'm aging myself, but I think we're thinking roughly late, late 90s, if not early 2000s. And if you remember, the initial e-commerce was I took my brochure that was paper and I put it into a PDF and I put the PDF on a website and I said, ta-da, I've got e-commerce. It actually took us several years, if not decades, to figure out how to actually process a transaction electronically, how to take credit cards. Back in the day, it was crazy for us to think that we would put our credit card into a website and press process. That sounds incredibly risky. When we think about where we are, remember we're early. The opportunity is huge. And those who capture it first will have an advantage while the rest of the market matures. But here's what I'll tell you, Bernard. We talked a lot about technology today. The technology piece is all solvable. It's something that can be unpacked. It's something that smart people can look at and people can decide. But like e-commerce, it, ena it entails a philosophical shift, a recognition that data is not merely a resource or resource, but actually a compass, right? And so we have to figure out as a company, how are we going to use these new co-pilots? What sort of insights are we going to build into our people and our process? so that we can increase the productivity, the efficiency, and the wisdom of the humans in our organization. It sounds kind of crazy, but like this all comes back to people, process, and technology. The technology's there. There, there are so many companies you know, within 100 miles of me and across the rest of the world that will solve for those challenges. But as humans, we need to evolve the way we're building our organizations and the processes under which we run our business to think about how we're gonna leverage it, right? And this really becomes really cultivating this data-driven mindset across all facets of a business strategy. And rather than implementing AI as this little plugin that we put into our internet or our corporate browser, it becomes something that is integrated into the fabric of the organization. And every human knows how they can leverage these co-pilots to do their job better. Very good. So if anyone listening or watching us today could walk away with just three top tips or key success criteria to really drive successful deployment of AI and modern analytics, what would be the, the three tips that you would include? Sure. So number one, we talked about earlier in the, uh, in the video today, prioritize data quality prioritize data quality. There is no way around it. Hold your teams accountable to curate their library before sending in the PhDs, the GPUs, to learn from it. Have each part of your organization take ownership for their data pipeline. Number two, embrace simplicity and eliminate unnecessary complexity. Whether you're looking at energy consumption or whether you're looking at human overhead, the fact is you're going to need more energy and more humans to deliver these projects. And I would tell you that infrastructure, specifically storage, is a huge opportunity. And Pure Storage has a proven track record of really eliminating not just the human overhead, but a lot of the energy inefficiency of traditional legacy storage systems. And then third, foster a culture of curiosity. Mm -hmm. Encourage your teams to explore the data, 
question the assumptions, question the models, challenge the boundaries and discover insights that have been hiding in plain sight. Ask the business leaders how and what the value will be from leveraging these digital co-pilots in how they do their jobs, right? No one wants to be told, hey, I want you to be more productive. It would be great if we could increase productivity. That can sometimes be viewed negatively. But if the organization starts to see that the AI investment is actually there as an engine to help humans do what we're best at, which frankly, in many cases is reasoning, communication, uh, thinking through things, but we're going to provide them with a digital co-pilot that's going to do a lot of things that humans may not be good at. Sorting through reams and reams of information, finding patterns, figuring out, you know, predictive models. And so really fostering this culture of curiosity will be critical. Very good. That was fascinating. Thank you so much for your time, Sean. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave the audience with? Yeah, I mean, look, clearly, Bernard, you, I'm passionate about this. Right. I'm in a stage of my career where I fundamentally believe that, you know, the last phase of my career, the next call it 15 years, uh, this is what we will be talking about. This is what organizations will be building on. And, you know, as you could tell from my enthusiasm, I'm extremely excited that AI and ML are finally here and that they represent a tremendous opportunity. Um, I also am very excited to look and watch and work with the companies that are leveraging this new technology and to actually start to see new leaders emerge, new trillion dollar companies emerge with this huge advantage. Um, but I'm also excited to be a pure storage because I do believe that, this, that storage is the foundation of this. And if we don't solve for storage and we don't think about energy and efficiency, um, we won't be able to extract uh, the value of our data. And so, you know, with that exciting time, exciting place, uh, and I'm really looking forward to talking about it further. So, uh, you know, thank you also for the opportunity. And uh, obviously, you know, here at Pure Storage, we're happy to talk to any of your listeners, uh, delve into some of their projects and, uh, you know, uh, kick the ball a little further down the field. Very good. Yeah, I really enjoyed the super interesting insights. Anyone who ever wants to re-watch or re-listen, you can watch it on my YouTube channel or listen to it on my podcast. Until next time, I will see you soon. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Wow, what a great conversation. Uh, so much learning going on. Um, it's interesting because, you know, we tend to think of, or at least I tend to think of AI and ML in terms of what they can do um, and the things they can lead to both uh, both uh, good and bad. But I don't think of the storage aspect of AI and how much data is being created all that often. So this was really valuable for me uh, to hear today. Um, I really enjoyed that. And I hope uh, all of you attendees did too. Thanks for all of your great questions as well. Now we will not be able to do a live Q and A today, but Pure will follow up on all of your questions and get back to you ASAP. So if you asked a question that didn't get answered, have no fear, you will hear back from them. And I want to thank uh, Bernard and Sean uh, for being here. So much fun to have you on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the presentation and the great discussion. And folks, that means we are moving on to our last uh, bit of the event here. The only thing I have left to do is give away a $250 Amazon gift card. Uh, as I mentioned up top, you do need to be in attendance for the entire event to be eligible for the card. And the winner of today's uh, card is Gregory Massey from Kansas. Congratulations to you, Gregory. We'll be in touch to get you your card ASAP. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank Pure Storage for making this event possible. I want to thank you attendees for being here. It's always great to be with you. And uh, thanks for your time and attention and enthusiasm. Uh, and we are uh, done now, folks. That concludes the event. Have a great rest of your day. I'll see you next time.